What's up, Aletheia family? This is Pastor Adam. I hope that you are having a great experience worshiping with us so far. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are continuing in our teaching series called The Test, where we're looking at David's tests, the things that came upon his life as a way to understand our destiny and the things that are come upon our lives. Now, so far, things have gone pretty well for King David, except until last week. Now, last week is really when the entire kind of literary work of uh, First and Second Samuel really pivot, especially in the story of David. Because last week we studied how David decided to take Bathsheba, decided to sleep with her, decided to uh, utterly forget God and, and do some terrible, terrible things. We learned that he failed the test of entitlement. Now. The interesting thing is that God forgave him. When, when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, God forgave him, but God did not remove the consequences of his sin. And so today, we're going to look at a huge chunk of text. We're actually going to go from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 18, but don't worry, I'm not going to read you five chapters of the Bible. But we're going to look at the story of Absalom, one of David's sons, and we're going to see how David dealt with the test of apathy. So, before we summarize the story, I want to take us to the very, very end of that story and go to 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 31 through 33. Here it is. And behold, the Cushite came and said, Good news for my lord the king, for the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. And the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went to another chamber over the gate and wept. And as he wept, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would that I had died instead of you. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is God's word. So thank you, God. Help us understand this story. Help us understand the test of apathy when it comes to us and how we can pass it. In Jesus' name, amen. It would probably be helpful for us to consider David's roadmap toward this moment because this is a terribly sad moment. And what we're going to find out is that from this moment, he's, he's really emotionally shattered and he's not the same man we met at the first part of the book. Now, as we said, it began with David and Bathsheba. David uh, had just lost a son. You'll remember that God, to um, punish David, he took David's son. And so I have to wonder, in that moment, when David really messed up as a dad, when David really messed up as a man, when David really messed up as a king and a husband and a father, when David's family stuff started really breaking apart and he really, really made a huge mistake, I have to wonder if David didn't begin to just pull away from the whole idea of family. You see, it's a perfectly common phenomenon for you and for me that in order to avoid emotional pain, we avoid the things that cause us emotional pain. And one of the most common ways to avoid the things that cause us to emotional pain is to try our best not to care to try our best to disengage from that thing, even if that thing is your own family. And I have to wonder at this moment, when, when David saw, I've really been a terrible husband, I've been a terrible man, I've been a terrible dad, and it's cost a child of mine his life. I have to wonder if David didn't just say, you know what, maybe it's best if I back off a little bit. So with that as a background, the very next chapter takes us to a story of Amnon and Tamar. Now, Amnon was one of David's sons, and Tamar was one of David's daughters. Tamar was the sister of Absalom, which we'll get to in just a moment. But, but Amnon, Amnon was a, was a broken man, and he, he lusted for his sister, and he ends up raping his sister Tamar, and it ruins her life. Now, Tamar's brother, Absalom, finds out. And, and as you might imagine, as a good brother, Absalom is furious at this injustice. He's furious at what's happened to his sister, and he's furious that the king, David, is doing nothing. This makes Absalom even angrier. And so in his anger over both his father's indifference to this terrible injustice and his anger over what's actually happened to his sister, Absalom has his brother Amnon assassinated. 
And so Absalom is banished from David's sight, banished from the king's presence for years. I think it was three years. And, and this slowly just begins to make David so sad. So now here's David's emotional situation. Not only has he lost a baby, but he's lost a son, and he's lost the other son who murdered this son. Already we're seeing that David is reaping what he has sown. Just as he murdered a man, now his own sons are murderers. Just as he raped a woman, now one of his own sons is a rapist. Something really terrible has entered the kingdom. But Joab, being a friend of David and the commander of the army, Joab arranges a really interesting situation for for David to bring Absalom back. And, and David does bring Absalom back, but he doesn't bring him into his presence. And so for quite some time, Absalom is over here, not in the actual presence of the king until many years later. Now, imagine how David felt in these moments. Imagine a story about himself that is being woven in his mind. Imagine what he's telling himself. He raped a woman and murdered a man, and now his own kids are rapists and murderers. He is experiencing all of the outcome of his own sin, and he's probably thinking, I'm a terrible dad. I'm a terrible, terrible husband, and I've done something really terrible to my family. I don't know if you've lived long enough to do something that you regret or to find out that you've done something rather regrettable. I have, and it's awful. It's awful to discover that something you tried to be good at, maybe you weren't great at. It's awful to discover that someone you really love, you really ended up hurting. It's awful to discover that this thing that you feel called to do, or this thing that you are actually called to do, you have not done well and it's really hurt someone else. Imagine what David had been telling himself. Imagine how much safer and secure, therefore, it felt for him to just back away, for him to to pull back a little bit and not show up to his responsibilities to be a dad or to be a husband or to be the godly man in his home that he was called and commanded to be. It probably felt like the best way for him not to drown in his own emotionality. Now, I don't know about you and how strongly you feel your own feelings, but I do know about David, and I know that David felt his own emotions really strongly, and sometimes he was even ruled by them. So perhaps in a moment of desperation, he's just trying to manage his own emotionality, and he says, you know what, I gotta back up. I'm not a good dad, I'm not a good good at this family thing, so maybe I should just disengage. But here's the thing. At that moment, at the temptation to disengage from the thing that has caused you pain is the test of apathy. When it comes to you, and man, it will come, what are you going to do? David failed the test of apathy in the belief that it would rescue him from his own emotionality. But here's the dirty secret. If we fail the test of apathy and we are apathetic toward our own sin or the sin that God wishes us to confront, it will only multiply in the next generation. Hear that. If you and I are apathetic to the things going on where we are supposed to be going, the the broken things where we are supposed to show up and fix them, if we don't take responsibility and we are instead apathetic toward those things, if we're indifferent, then those sins and that brokenness will only multiply in the next generation. And that's exactly what happened here. David's angry at Absalom for murdering Amnon, but for some reason not at the rape of his daughter, which is really awful. And Absalom is angry at David and his indifference over the rape of his sister. So you see that these two men, father and son, they're they're pulled apart because they are both angry at each other. And that antipathy that forms from anger and trying not to care produced rebellion. So here's what happened. Absalom decided, you know what, my dad is not a just king. I could be a just king. I know how important justice is because it's been denied to me. So here's what would happen. Uh, Back in the day, if you had an issue, there was no like court system or Supreme Court. If you had an issue, you would go and speak to the king. And so outside of the city gates, many people would line up with their issues and ask the king for his judgment. But Absalom decided to pitch a little tent and start his own little court right there. And so his people from all over the nation of Israel would come and ask for King David's wisdom. Before he could get to them, before these people could talk to King David, Absalom would intercept them and say, you know what, David's probably not going to see it quite like I would see it. 
So this desire for justice and this experience of injustice, all because of King David's apathy and indifference, or he should have cared, produced a rebellion wherein many more people died. So after Absalom's little sideshow, you know, grand jury that he was doing for himself, eventually he'd gathered enough people around him who were like, you know what, Absalom would be a better king. And he started a rebellion that culminated in a giant war, a war that was so difficult and that was so tragic and that was such a big deal that David himself had to flee from Jerusalem. Now think about this. Think about a civil war erupting in our country such that the president had to flee the White House. That, that's, that's unthinkable to us, yet that's exactly what happened here. David's own son was leading a rebellion to supplant him. Think about this, because this was supposed to be a kingdom like no other. This kingdom was supposed to run on God's principles. This kingdom was supposed to demonstrate not the hellishness of the world and other ancient Near Eastern kingdoms. This kingdom was supposed to be a little outpost of lost Eden and future heaven, and it was all falling apart because its leader failed some very important tests. So Absalom organizes this rebellion and forces David to flee from his own palace. And for a second time, David is a wanderer in the wilderness, except this time he is not an innocent man. And so the fighting continues. And, and David, David, when you read this story, David's like really emotionally torn. On the one hand, he wants his enemies to be defeated. We've got Psalm 3 and we've got Psalm 36 that were written uh, around the time of this rebellion. And we know David won a victory, yet also David wanted his son. Remember, for all of David's mistakes, He's got this tender heart, a heart that is never hardened towards sin, even if sometimes he tries to pull his heart away from that which hurts him. But finally, the rebellion ends when Absalom is killed. But when David finds out, we hear what he says in the text that we read. Absalom, my son, my son. Try to get this picture in your head. David in his royal tent being treated as a king, getting reports of generals from the battle lines, and he hears that his son has died. And he's so emotional about it that he has to go to another place, and his weeping is so loud that someone else was able to hear it and write it down. Absalom, my son, my son, would that I have died instead of you. Why do we take some time to go through all of this? Because I want to make this simple point to you. Apathy always leads to tragedy. Apathy always leads to tragedy. David's indifference to the suffering of his own daughter and his son led to the tragic loss of even more daughters and more sons. And what's more, the emotional security that apathy promises turns out not to be there at all. Because what happens is when we are apathetic toward those things that we should be caring about, the sin that we're meant to be confronting, the injustice that we are meant to be ameliorating only multiplies in the next generation. And finally, it breeds insecurity. You see, if if I try really hard not to care about something that I'm supposed to care about, let's say I try really hard not to care about this church even though I'm assigned by God as its pastor. I try really hard not to care about my family even though I'm their father and I'm my wife's husband. The security and the emotional safety that that promises turns out never to materialize and it will only make me more and more insecure. And that's exactly what happened to David. He got back to his throne. He won the rebellion, but he was a broken man. And the rest of 2 Samuel merely details how his brokenness affected everything around him. The amazing thing about following Jesus, friends, the amazing thing about being on this side of this story and not living in it is to try and map the ways David parallels and then doesn't parallel his far-off grandson, a better king, King Jesus. You see, unlike David, you and I have a heavenly father who is not apathetic toward us, even though we have totally rebelled against him. This father, like David, knows what it's like to weep over the loss of a son, and yet the loss of the son was not tragedy merely, but there to redeem us. Has it ever occurred to you that God has kind of a messed up family? Yeah. Did you ever think about that? Like God is a perfect father, I think we can all agree. 
And yet his family, I don't mean the Trinitarian family of the Father and Son and Spirit, but, but his children, us, humans, the people he made, we're a bunch of rebels. We are a bunch of Absaloms. We are the same kind of people who have accused God of injustice. We are the same kind of people who've accused God of apathy. God's got kind of a messed up family. And yet, he did not allow the brokenness of his earthly children to keep him from showing up and caring. That's the amazing thing about Jesus because unlike David, he fully engaged where David was apathetic and pulled away. Unlike Absalom, Christ doesn't think his father unjust. And unlike David, our heavenly father is not indifferent to our suffering. Where David's family was torn apart for David's sin, the Trinitarian family, particularly Jesus Christ himself, had his body torn apart for our sin, not his own. See, apathy is always going to be the temptation that you experience when something you love produces pain for you. You're gonna feel like maybe I should just not care, but we are called to be a people of faith who show back up to that thing, to that relationship, to that calling, believing that it can be better the next time, believing that the Holy Spirit can do something through us the next time, believing that the resurrection power of Jesus means that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in me and can flow through me to that thing that keeps on hurting me. We're to be those who engage the world, especially when it hurts us. We do engage with the love and the grace of the gospel. So, my friend, what are you tempted to pull away from? What are you tempted to, to try and not care about that you know you are to care about? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, an instance of injustice. Well, if we're ever going to stop injustice in the next generation, we have to address it in this one, and we can't be apathetic toward it. Maybe, maybe you've got a wayward child like David did. And, and maybe, maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm a terrible mom or I'm a terrible dad and, and it would just be safer and easier to just back away. Don't do that. Engage with faith, trusting that God can do something in your child's life. Maybe you're a husband or a wife feeling like super estranged from your spouse and you're thinking, this hurts so much, I can't expose myself to this pain anymore. Maybe I should just try not to care. Resist that temptation and pass the test of apathy because as you engage, you are acting like Jesus. And when we act like Jesus with eyes on Jesus, then the Holy Spirit enables us to do this for Jesus. So this all begs the question, if we're gonna do that, how do we pass this test? I have three things that seem to arise from this text as I've studied it for you this week. And so I'll offer them to you this way. First, I think it would be really helpful if you and I can become increasingly aware of our own emotionality. Let me say that again. I, I think if we're gonna pass this test, you and I have to become increasingly aware of our own emotionality. Now, I got well into my mid-30s before I was able to say accurately how I felt. Now, that's my own emotional immaturity and stuff from my own past, but I wonder, can you? Can you actually describe, okay, here's what's going on in me, because until you can describe what's going on in you, it'll be very hard for you to locate the temptation when it comes to you to simply pull away, because you might not even know that you're in pain. So I think it would really help if we could become increasingly aware of our emotionality. The second thing that I would encourage you to do is to simply remove the option of disengaging from your family or your close relationships. When your family or your close relationships cause you pain, as they did for David, your temptation is going to be to try and become indifferent, to try and become apathetic. That way you can shield yourself from the pain. So I want to encourage you today, simply decide that that is not an option, that, that abandonment is not an option, that divorce is not an option, that leaving the relationship is not an option, that, that abandoning your post is not an option because you are gonna trust God through this test. And the third thing I would really encourage you to do is to remember the gospel story that disarms the temptation toward apathy. Why? Because our Savior did not give into it. Look, if anyone deserved to be forgotten about, it was the people who rebelled against their Heavenly Father. If anyone deserved not to be engaged over, 
It was us. And if anyone had the best excuse to not come and show up and save us, it was God who was not at all on the hook to do that, but because he wanted to give us a better story, because he didn't want to leave us all like Absaloms, dying in our own rebellion, he became better than David. He stepped into history. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death in our place where we rebels should have, and he rose so that we Absaloms can rise too. See, for David, apathy led to tragedy. But I believe that does not have to be your story. So God, help us. Help us to resist the temptation toward apathy, to engage with faith and hope and love, and to see the dawning of your glory, even in the most painful of our situations. In Jesus' name, amen.